All right. Uh, good evening. And I wanted to do, on the way in, uh, once I got over the panic of, of uh, being late or the car being loud, uh, I had this thought. I wanted to do a check-in. How, how's everybody doing? Doing okay? Okay. This uh, You're out of your boots, so you're just a happy camper. Right? You have, uh, what's that dessert over there that you like so well? Sandwiches. I was just wondering about how our group's doing because <clears throat> um, the, these first couple weeks is apt to sometimes touch on some of our some of our own stuff. Okay, um, our, our childhoods, and best I know, none of us have had a perfect childhood, and uh, it could it could bring up a painful memory. Some of the things we talked about, and. Uh, Many of you, uh, most of you perhaps, have raised children. The best I know, there hasn't been a perfect parent on the, the planet um, other than God in the garden. Uh, so it could bring up some regrets and things like that. Um, so is everybody, if you're noticing sometimes just a little bit of feeling a little bit off maybe from the presentations, that would be normal. And I just want to make sure everybody's doing okay. Everybody doing okay? Tonight, and why I ask... Uh, tonight in particular uh, will be the heaviest of the four nights, and it will touch on uh, more of our stuff. And uh, if you can think back to the, the first night, we kind of unpacked a little bit about knowing more about the young people that we share life with, and uh, they're going to be all over the board, right, as far as, um, as life experiences and um, their openness to God, to relationships. So we just want to be careful not to try to be too narrow in our stereotypes. Second night, we talked about what's an ideal environment look like for faith to emerge. There's going to be environments that are going to be pretty sterile and less than ideal for faith to emerge. There's going to be environments that are going to be rich and, uh, and with the way God intended for faith to emerge. And those, remember the two big components are going to be trying to help our young people, or our friends, whatever age, to encounter God's creation. Just as simple as trying to find ways for them to be outside and just to, to wonder that. And the other thing is just these intergenerational relationships. So tonight we're going to talk a bit about what's it look like of, of how we interact with young people. This will be important. This will touch into some of our stuff. It will have a bit of a sting to it. And it also perhaps might challenge you and what your go-to has been as far as uh, coming across kids that are struggling with faith. So I'm going to start out. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It, some of you might remember my um, oh, less than glorious um, experience of being in my 20s and really living far away from the whole idea of God, living like a like a heathen. And after what has been a very profound conversion, um, before that I was in show, ca show cattle was the world that I lived in and worked in. And uh, after um, accepting Christ in my life and becoming a disciple, uh, so for some reason or another, we had young people come into our house, and I know I shared some of those ministry regrets of, of uh where I failed some kids that were coming to the house, but our group continued to grow. And we, we'd meet in the barn on Monday nights. The barn would fill up from anywhere from 40 to 80 high school kids from all around, all within a, all, probably a 60, 80 mile radius. And one thing we'd do on some of the nights was uh, we would have a, um, kind of an open mic where we would we would read scripture or the kids would have small groups and uh, and encounter scripture and have sort of what you might call an inductive Bible study where they were discovering scripture and reading for themselves and we'd have a time where they could respond to that, just some honest raw noticing of what they noticed from, from the reading and they, the kids were, felt pretty comfortable with each other would come up and share we had a night where uh it was a pretty full night. We had just this old pieces of fragment carpet in the barn and things, and kids would be sitting all over the floor and on bales of hay and show boxes and things. And one at a time, the kids would come up and share. And this particular night, a lot of kids there, and this girl who had come from a, a neighboring town was cheerleader 
and she was a valedictorian of her class. I, I knew she was a top student at her school and was a senior. Uh, and one of these kids with a lot of charisma, a leader, and the kids really liked her. And she was right in the thick of this, coming on these Monday nights. And this night that we had some uh, open mic time, well, she stands up and comes to the front. And, but as she sat down and took the mic, all of a sudden I noticed something was up. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see the mic is just shaking. And I looked over, and she's frozen. And her skin is ashen. I mean, she, just all the colors out of her face. And then suddenly the room said something was happening, and the room was just still. And, of course, I, I was uncomfortable, and I felt like just, you know what we do when we're uncomfortable, you just want to say stuff to break the ice or whatever, and or bail her out. And I felt like I needed to wait, so I just waited. And she sat there with that mic, and the group is just, what's, you know, they're just hanging on, what's about to be said? And finally, that girl, the valedictorian, all right, cheerleader, um, this popular kid's been coming with this group right in the thick of this peer culture. She was one of the stars of the group. She says, uh, with just no expression, just this white, white as a sheep face, she says, she eeks out these words. I don't believe in God. And I've been afraid to tell anybody because I thought everybody would be mad at me. Have you ever had anything like that come your way? We're going to look at that tonight. I'm going to circle back now and tell you how that thing turned out, okay? I'm going to first just do a quick review. Remember our word, metanoia? Okay, we talked about that it's a it's this whole change of person. It has repentance, looking back, having some regret over how things have gone, but it's so much more than that. It's starting to reimagine. C.S. Lewis fans in the room? Got, got, oh man, this, this is a, there's a lot. Do you happen to know a book that he read before he was a Christian that made a huge difference in his life? Yeah, if you read his biography, Surprised by Joy. <coughs> yes. All right, well done. Uh, Fantastic. I never can pronounce it. Yeah, it's our Say it one more time. Fantastic. Fantastic. By George McDonald. And he says that book, and he did not become a Christian after reading that book, but he said that book baptized my imagination. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it became possible to believe. All right, that so this whole thing of repentance has has lots of stages to it. But that that he would uh, attribute that book to what he might call as pre-conversion. So uh, this reimagining is part of metanoia, this new understanding, there's some acceptance, forgiveness is implied in that, a change of being, moral conviction, and what John the Baptist would say: this bear fruit, keeping with. Right. Um, I'm gonna, the time has come, the kingdom of God's near, repent, undergo metanoia, and believe the good news. Uh, here's a quote uh, that, that I really like. Um, Doug Paget. information alone rarely suffices to create belief. Beliefs form when information finds a partner with people's hopes, experience, ideas, and thoughts. If, has anybody ever... Um, found the frustration of maybe trying to share the gospel with someone with the per the right information, okay, by the book, and uh, and you can sense as you're sharing it, there's just it's not that you're facing really resistance. There's just it's not connecting. Have you ever had that? You can sense it right as perhaps you're sharing it. Um, I think there's so much to this. Um, Augustine, I think, said, and I'm paraphrasing him, um, it's hard to believe what you can't imagine. Uh, so we think about maybe young people that have had very, very 
unfortunate backgrounds, especially around fathers. And there's a lot of healing that's going to have to take place being around with some healthy relationships and probably some healthy males in particular to start to warm up to this idea of Abba being something real, right? So, uh, yeah, we better have a quiz, right, Elijah? Let's go. <laughs> Can I help? You guys, hey, by the way, yes, would you please? Um, they did a lot better last week, too, didn't they? Mike, uh, yes. uh, when you said that, connecting with people's ideas and hopes and things like that, uh, reminded me, I've probably said this among this group before, but uh, I had a professor at Tech, I paid a lot of money to get this information, so it's <laughs> worth a lot. Uh, but anyway, she said, you know, if everybody in this room wore glasses, which many of us do, we were to all put our glasses in a box and then at random pick out a pair of glasses and put on, only those of us who had similar prescriptions would be able to see through the other person's lenses. And so when, when we talk about people's worldviews and other things like that and their experiences, uh, unless, unless we can understand that they have perhaps a different perspective than we do, it's difficult, difficult yeah. to reach them with whatever information we're trying to share. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a good analogy. Well said. Yeah, thanks for that. This, oh, good job, man. You got this. Okay. Um, I'll just read through them because there's a couple weird words in here. Most American adolescents live the vast majority of their extra familial. Suzanne, what's that mean? Extra familial. That sounds like something a trainer from Boys Ranch would say. I don't believe I'm that definition of that word, sir. That um, their time, uh, other than time with family in the home, okay? So other than that time around dinner table or something like that. Uh, most live in age stratified institutions consuming age targeted products and services. Okay, true or false? Two, religiously engaged teens are more likely than religiously disengaged teens to feel that their parents understand them, love and accept them for who they are, and pay enough attention to them. <clears throat> Number three, the vast majority of U.S. teens are alienated or rebellious when it comes to religious involvement in their faith community. And four, religiously engaged teens are more likely to eat more dinners per week with one or both of their parents than religiously disengaged teens. True or false? Okay. Are you ready? Here we go. One, how many said true? How many said false? Hey, yep. Good job, people. All right. That is very true. Okay. Um, most American adolescents, and this is not a good thing, okay, but think about how much of their lives, other than if they're, if they're blessed enough to have a family that actually gets together and connects some, and that's not even happening in a lot of cases, but our kids are, they're segregated by age, and that's probably a recent phenomenon within the last 100, 100 years or so. So, not a good thing. We need to have intergenerational relationships. We talked about that last week. Two, how many said true? How many said false? That's the true, okay? Um, religiously engaged teens are more likely to feel that their parents understand, love, and accept them for who they are, pay enough attention to them. Um, number three, how many said true? Okay, that, this is the third week we've had this on the quiz, okay? All right? That's still false. <laughs> I'm like, it'll be up next week, too, because I want you to know that that is a myth, okay? They've come to find out that most teens, majority, that means there are some, they're outliers that, that may not be so crazy, but a vast majority really are very okay about, about the, uh, uh, they don't feel alienated, like, like the myth goes. Um, Religiously engaged teens more likely eat more dinners, true or false? True. I'm going to say false. I think that first week really messed with, with a few of you because you think that I have a lot of these trick questions. <laughs> that, is, that is true. Um, what, do you make of, what do you make of that, by the way? Uh, that fourth one? Yeah, the fourth one, let's say. Uh, 
It just makes sense to me that the kids who are religiously engaged are generally going to be spending more time with their parents who are most likely also religiously engaged mm -hmm. and probably spending time eating. You know, the one thing that they can't determine from this is if, which causes which, uh, right? But what we do know, there is a positive relationship between uh, religious engagement and eating meals together. Mm -hmm. Does eating the meals together lead to better religious engagement, or does a religious engagement lead to those choices at home to eat together? Then you, you can discuss that, okay? But there's a positive relationship there. And I'll contend that this is a very simple thing. If I were talking to a young, just a group of young parents, this is a simple thing. I'd say start right here if you're worried about the, the, the spiritual health of your child. You have a non-negotiable, you, you protect that, that meal time at home. All right, that'd be the place to start. Uh, Mike, uh, back up to number three, can you? Sure. What, uh, how are you defining faith communities? Yeah. When, when you say their faith communities. Yeah, when they did this survey, and I'm just going on this uh, National Study of Youth and Religion that's, that, they're, that they're continuing to work with this same group doing longitudinal work. They are surveying, they'll, they'll have... Um, they'll have Mormons in that group, they'll, they'll have uh, every denomination of Christianity you could think of. They're, they're, uh, they're scientists that aren't trying to decide which of these religions are true or best, but just American religious teens. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's a whole bunch of what you'd say Christian denominations, uh, but it's, uh, it's quite a broad group. But their faith communities, wherever they are, they're okay with them. And they really like the adult relationships that exist there. So it could be Judaism. It could be Judaism. Muslims, whatever. I, I think there might be some Muslim kids who showed up on the survey. Well, yes. could it even be uh, Wiccan communities? Uh, you know, if their parents it, are in that kind of thing. It, it could be. I don't think many of those showed up. And I'd have to look mm -hmm. again. That, that would be a pretty small yeah, little time group time with, with time. the slice they did. It, it just occurred to me when yeah. you said their faith communities, if they, if they grew up in an Islamic faith family, mm -hmm. uh, they're probably not rebellious for that. Yeah, it, it showed that the, those are some things that transcended. He wasn't trying to decide, is this a true religion or a false religion? They were just looking at kids that belong to a faith community of any kind. How, how did they relate to those adults in those faith communities? So that's what, that's what the survey would show us. Um, tells us a lot about uh, the kids need us and it's, it's, it does take some engagement on our part they really do want those relationships they need, they need the relationships and if you remember back uh, a couple weeks ago the kids do not have very good understanding about the doctrine of their whatever their faith community is especially the Christian denominations did not do very well and it's very fuzzy foggy so um, they could, and the kids are okay to being taught what it shows. Do you think that's true, Elijah? Oh, that's I mean. Is it? I mean, yeah, it's, uh, so I don't want to tarry here too long because I want to talk about that girl that doesn't believe, that doesn't believe in God. Um, there was a, there was a night at Boys Ranch, oh, this had probably been, oh, 14 years ago, perhaps, and it was a night that the kids were very, very hard to like. <laughs> okay. Can you imagine that? And, and I wasn't feeling like a good preacher that night or a good uh, pastor or a chaplain um, because I, I was miserable in the room. We had about 40 kids in, in this room we were going to have a retreat off ranch. So this was a front-loading meeting to give them just here's what to expect, what time to show up, what to bring, what not to, not to bring, and those expectations. And, and then we were going to pre-pray for the prayer retreat. Okay, these are kids that signed up for this. They didn't have to be there. So you'd think that they'd be motivated to kind of act, fake it and act like little angels, right? <laughs> they were not. And it was like a war zone. And it was the Hatfields and McCoys. And uh, 
Um, you uh, ladies you might be disappointed to know that it was your fault. It was the, the, the it was the females in the room that caused all the trouble. And it seems like that's just how it, how it goes, isn't it? <laughs> we had, Starting we had, with that fruit on a tree. <laughs> we, had, we had two strong personality girls. Uh oh. And they 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 butted heads over the same guy. And they had the whole room sucked into this what the the kids call it drama. We used to call it sin, right? But they call they call it drama. <laughs> and, and it was cussing and fussing, and it wasn't directed towards the adults in the room. We were just invisible. I mean, they were so into their drama, and and I I remember having a pity party, and I was thinking, Lord, is this a sign that I'm done at Boys Ranch? Because I've been there, been there about two or three years, and I thought maybe this was a sign because I was ready to go. And here's what we did. Uh, this was not the plan, but we just, you know, sometimes a youth room might have some random stuff that looks kind of like a bad garage sale, like that room has all that, you know, okay, you know what I'm talking about. We had some of that stuff, and there was some note cards, and, and there was some, uh, little baskets with number two pencils, and then those cheap big stick pens, the white ones with the blue tops that everybody chews on. Okay, you got the cheapest ones in the store. Passed out the cards, passed out the writing utensils. I got on a microphone because to try to get over the, all the, the noise in the room, and this is what I told the group. I said, no matter how good your life ever gets, no matter how good your thinking ever gets about life's big puzzles, and no matter how close a relationship with God might ever feel, you can imagine that. What's the question that you just don't get? And if you have one, you write it on the card. And uh, if you don't mind it being shared, just don't sign your name and you can put it in a pile up here up front. But it's all, it's your business. You don't have to write a thing and you don't have to bring a card. Well, here's what happened. That room, and I can still remember this. The sound of those cheap ballpoint pens on those cards, those seem loud. And then here in a little while, kids just, and there's no one saying a peep. The kids start flowing to the front, and they start dropping their cards in the pile. I had to inspect the cards. I've carried these cards in my bag for 14 years, 13 years now. Um, what I'd like to invite our group to do, and I think the, the best way to experience these cards is to lend them human voice. Um, those who are able, um, just in no certain order, if you're able to read a card, read, read, read a card. If you're not able, no guilt trip, okay? This might, they might, might be too emotional to read a card or you might not be comfortable reading out loud. So do, don't, don't pressure yourself if you can't do that. If you have a card and you think it needs human voice and you're not able to, you can pass it to a neighbor to see if they can read it. So let's, uh, let's, let's hear the cards now. Yeah. Why do I make the choices that I make? Why am I trying to live when I'm just living to die? Why do people think I can be a leader of the world? Why did my dad have to leave? Why do people feel the need to put others down to make themselves feel good about who they are? Why every time I have a boyfriend, it always goes wrong and I get treated like dirt? Why did God allow these things to happen to me? Why has God put up with the bad things in the world why do people leave or go away? Why is this 
so hard to do. God, why did I need to feel love and have sex with all those boys, knowing they didn't love one, but kept my mind thinking that way? Why do so many people I care about leave? Why are so many innocent kids dealt such a miserable hand so often by the adult world? Why did my mom choose her drugs over me, and why did you let me get taken away? God, why did you make it that where people argue and don't get along with? Why am I bad? Why can't everyone just get along? Why don't people care? Because all they care about is themselves. You're not a part of my life. I didn't want you in the first place. You were a mistake. Why do people let me down if they say they love me? Why is there so much pain, suffering in the world? Why am I not wise, but why do I not like? Why am I picked but why do I pick? Why do you still love me? Why is there war and hate and discrimination? Why did you allow our mind to be hateful and sinful? Why do my loved ones get taken away? I am mad at God. Why am I hated? Why I don't do get do? why I'm still at Boys Ranch. Why people do the things they do? Why does the person who loves you let a person who they barely know take advantage of you? Why do people have to be two-faced? Why can't me and my dad get along? Why does God allow things in people's lives that seem to draw them away from Him? Why do my brother die? Why do I have to suffer from all these tragedies if He loves me? Why did my brother die? Lord, why every time I give people a chance, they just hurt me in the long run? Why is it so hard for me to trust the so called friends? Why do I have a mom, real mom, that doesn't care, and a stepmom who does? Let's pause right there. Um, first, I want to say say thank you uh, for the respect and the reverence with the cards. Um, and thanks for lending your voice. Uh, now, the uh, question I want to ask is, uh, did the cards did the cards surprise you? I would say no. I'll ask groups this, and I'll get about 50-50 on this question. Yep, there's, there's some that are going to say no, and there's some that are going to say yes. And I'm a yes and a no person, actually. What, um, what do, they, they don't surprise you. Uh, the content of the cards did su surprise you? Probably because I've, I've been in environments uh, with people who feel those things and are trying to cope with that. Um, yeah, I, I know Suzanne can tell you the content of the cards. She knows the the intake, so the psychosocials and, uh, of the backgrounds of the kids, so the content wouldn't surprise Suzanne. Is there anything about the cards that, that nonetheless surprise you? No, but it's hard every time I hear it. You know, yeah. I've heard you do this part of the presentation before, and it's, it's always hard. I've done this a bunch. I've had these cards in my bag for a long time, and it's never easy to hear these cards. Was it hard to hear the cards? 
Yeah, there's a card, uh, wise mom choose drugs over me. It might be two cards that say that. There were, here's something interesting to know. <clears throat> These cards were not cherry picked um, in that there were no cards that came in where the kids just made a joke of the activity. That surprised me. I mean, teenagers, I mean, I was one once, and nobody just did a funny guy card. Not one. I did take two cards out tonight that content was, was might, might have been too excessive what they were reporting. I took two out that were pretty particularly rough. Uh, but <coughs> the content doesn't surprise me. Here's what surprised me. Uh, I did not see these cards coming out of that room at that time. Right? This, this room that was teenagers at their worst uh, rude, disrespectful, seemed self-centered, and I was not liking the kids in the room. And then, boom, that room did a 180. And then here are these cards. I did not see that coming. Um, anything else that surprised, maybe surprised some people about the cards? No one had a guitar, but I don't know any of them out there. What they see out there probably takes them 180 out from where they were. And it, and it puts the focus not on them, but on God and what He wants to know, them and their lives. Hmm. Do, do you think, let's go, Nathan. Yeah, sorry. Uh, go ahead and ask No, no, no. I was going to say that uh, uh, every year we have summer excitement, LCU. Uh, we do activities similar to this sort of thing, uh -huh. and uh, we never have any trouble with the kids. They're, they're always very uh, willing to do that sort of thing and meditate and think about that. Um, it's not surprising to me that the kind of content that would be written on them, but what is surprising to me is that, like those kids at Summer Excitement, you have kids who are equally uh, concerned and focused in that, that moment on something very serious that uh, I think all kids uh, find that a serious subject and I think we do not give them enough credit to talk about those kinds of things. And I think we need to. I think we need to be willing to talk to kids. Yeah, thanks for that. And did you notice with the cards, um, the kids were asking, did you notice the wisdom in the cards, it was, a, it was a painful wisdom but that they were acquired by fire, unfortunate fire, but they're asking questions that, that the philosophers have been writing books about for over 2,000 years. I mean, questions about what you call theodicy. You know, if God's all good, all powerful, all loving, why does bad stuff happen? That question is coming up. Very ex existential. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're so. asking the philosophers questions. I didn't see that coming. Um, also, did you notice the common thread of loss? That was a that, that was a common thread, wasn't it? The common threads of loss, betrayal, abandonment, rejection. Uh, they're trying to make sense of things. Um, so I was humbled. And if there's one takeaway tonight, the next time you have a kid in your space that's really, really um, trying you on, and you're seeing the worst of, of an American teenager, um, I, I hope you remember there, there's probably a red card behind that behavior. And I hope that can allow you to continue to find compassion. All right, you just never know, do you? Like the 13, like the 13 I want statements. And it actually goes around the back of your quiz and in the 13 <coughs> statements that you wanted. I'm going to have to, we're, we're short on time, so let me just try to wrap this up here. Um, what, when I do this training at Boys Ranch, when I try to talk our group through, a very familiar verse out of James, right? Let's be quick to what? Listen, slow to and slow to what? Anger. And this, the context that James is about adults getting along with each other, but this principle is vital to help these kids that when they come with this hard question, because here's what's going to happen. When they question God, 
Does that not push a button? Do you get just a little bit of anxiety and want to defend God as you go to? And what we do is, okay, you, you might, may or may not call that anger, but it will push a button, an emotional button, when a kid objects to God, pushes a button. And what do we do right away then? We go right to what? And when we're doing this, what are these doing? Nothing. So we just blow it right here. So if I could encourage you to, to practice a, uh, an approach with kids, if they trust you enough with a red card like that, um, to really practice this, you know, you can't drive a grain truck without a clutch. You need to push the clutch in right here, okay, and, and, and listen. And uh, that button gets pushed and you go into trying to defend God, um, you will shut down any future engagement that's going to be meaningful. So quick to listen, slow to speak, so that anger. That um, the night wrapped up, you would think that this exercise was a faith buster. And it was anything but that. So I want to say you welcome these kind of questions. Whenever a kid will voice something like this, things are freeing up. It almost frees up a log jam that's probably been there for a long time where faith suddenly becomes possible. Uh, this night, what we did is, uh, again, you know the junk in the, the, the youth room closet, right? Well, we had a bunch of candles for a candlelight service of varying lengths. We fished out the biggest ones that weren't all burnt to the nub, passed them around. We lit one candle and invited the kids to light their circle. And here's what they did. You, I said, okay, you've got a lit candle. You're invited to go and light one person's candle and return to your spot. If you're a praying person, you can pray for them first and light their candle. And as they were doing that in silence, we, uh, the other youth chaplain and I, read the cards with no explanation, no apology, no fix. We just read the cards just like we did just now. And that circle lit up. And here's what happened. And I'm pretty sure that bad picture, that's not like me trying to be cool with some kind of a photo filter. That was a bad picture that I took of that. I'm pretty sure it was that night. The way the circle lit up, enemy went over to their enemy. That's who they chose to light. Mm. Or I can still remember this one, and for some reason this really, really touches me. It was... The cool 12th grade boy, the senior, that's the it guy that's good at sports and kind of big man on campus type, going over to not the prettiest girl in the circle, somebody has a crush on or what, goes to this ninth grade boy, lost as a goose, half the people in the room don't know his name, and lights and, and honors him and lights his candle. And that's how all the candles lit. So you just see that it wasn't a faith buster, but the kids were just, just seemed very aware of God's presence and were moved in the most beautiful way. And none of us have ever been the same since. I don't know if you ever watch Open Range. There's a great quote in here that works for this. Um, where uh, this guy with all this baggage... He says, I've, I've been trying to put some bad times behind me, but sometimes they just don't stay put. Sue says, always makes me feel better. Let things breathe a little, not bury them. So if I could encourage you tonight to be that person that, that's that safe person that can let, without quick judgments and quick fixes, let that stuff breathe, that will actually help a kid come to faith. Yeah, and by the way, the girl, the, the girl that uh, didn't believe in God, when she said that, here's how that story ends. Uh, I didn't believe in, I don't believe in God. This, she just had to tell, she felt, I guess, so lousy of being fake. I don't believe in God, and I never wanted to tell anybody because I thought she'd be mad at me. I watched 40 kids sitting on this old nasty piece of carpet, just with this loving, smile and all together shake their hands they said no it's okay and that girl looked puzzled and, and says you're not mad at me and I says no and that girl just 
it, it was as if a glacier just gave way and she colored her and she just burst into tears and there was tears of joy and what happened was suddenly it became possible for her to believe mm -hmm. having just thrown up and said that and then for people to, to love her through that so uh, it was a beautiful moment here's your takeaways for tonight okay um, we need to meet young people first and always with compassion and curiosity right you never know what red cards behind whatever that you're getting from the young person right welcome hard questions without shock and shame and that's hard for us to do right because those hard questions freak us out a little bit and push our buttons but the shock and shaming, they're able to detect that if, whether we use words or not, or sense it. So to be able to love the hard questions like shock and shame. And it takes room to doubt to have space to believe. Mm -hmm. Don't erase that too quick for those of us that don't take short English. Okay. <laughs> Mike, uh, right now it seems like, uh, socially speaking, there's a uh, a movement of deconstruction occurring within the Christian faith with people of notoriety and things like that. I actually got asked a question about that today by someone uh, that I graduated high school with um, because he's having issues with that, not he himself, but kids at their church. And uh, one of the things a lot of people don't realize is they, they go with that mode of defending things and shaming rather than realizing every Christian worth their salt and their worth of the faith that they have actually naturally goes to some level of deconstruction. The important thing is to listen to them and give them those guardrails mm -hmm. and then be able to uh, guide them. Oh, that's a good way. Because that's what happens with these people who deconstruct and fall away is they don't have any guidance, they don't have guardrails, and sometimes they just give up and just give a quick answer. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I so behind the cards it said, uh, "Why does God let this happen?" Isn't it because He gave us free will? Um, that would be a common response to that. And uh, what I try to encourage our, my friends to do, when, if you're that friend with someone, because you're, you're going to find, if you haven't already, I bet you already have, sometimes had some friends in your life that have hard questions, there's a real temptation to uh, try to fix it all right there, or to explain what God might be doing. And I try to stay away from that and just listen and... and uh, and it seems like when I do that, I'm listening to God a little better. And then when I do have a word that I'm, of something I've become pretty sure of, then I can share that gently with that person. But usually these cards to say, uh, to give them theological answers and things like that, usually I'm, I'm not communicating well with that person. Especially, and I'm, I'm going too long now, but especially if the person is sharing from a wrecked heart, and I'm up here in my head with all the best C.S. Lewis problem of pain books and things I've read. It's a total miss. We're, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to their head, but they're not speaking to me from their head. They're, they're, they're wrecked right here. They just need right now just some pastoral care. So um, when, when you're not wrecked, but they are, we'll, miss, we'll start to answer from here. And, but their hurt's happening from here. But that, that's, a, that's a good thought. We could talk about that for a long time. I, I, I want to turn it over to Nathan and let you land the plane because I'm, I'm sorry we went too long. Uh, uh, this is, uh, um, no, that's all right. We'll just leave that. And this is what we've written down each week, okay? Yeah. Okay. The young people in our lives are in dire need of our calm, respectful, responsive attention. Let's read that together aloud. The young people in our lives are in dire need of our calm, respectful, responsive attention. Please give Mike a round of applause. Thank you.